Hello, my name is Holly and I'm part of the professional development team here at IISM. Thank you for joining today's webinar on business continuity, which has been organised with IISM partner Aveta. Before we get started, there are just a couple of things to run through first. So to begin with, you'll be on mute for the duration of the webinar, but you'll be able to ask any questions you have using the chat function on the bottom right of the screen. Type your questions as they come to mind and we will pick these up at the end. Secondly, the webinar is being recorded and a recording will be available on the IISM YouTube channel after the event. It will also be shared with Aveta. So today we're tackling the topic of business continuity, defining the new normal for building resilience into your supply chains. And over the next 45 to 60 minutes, we will cover um, introductions from the four speakers who were sharing their insights and experiences with you today, a presentation on the foundations of business continuity, and finally case studies and a discussion amongst the speakers on the theme before taking your questions at the end. So to begin with, I'd like to hand over to Mike Ford, who will kick the introductions off. Thanks, Holly. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today. Uh, I hope all who've taken the time to join the webinar are staying safe and well. So firstly, thanks to RSM uh, for assisting us in, in delivering this session. Uh, I've been a member myself for, for many years, so thank you for uh, helping to support us on this uh, session, Holly. Um, we've got some interesting logistical challenges, as I'm sure many of you will um, attest to with the, uh, the current situation. Um, I'm based in the northwest of England. Uh, we have a member of the panel based in Australia and others based down in the southeast of England. My name is Mike Ford. I'm the global lead for sustainability and EHS for Aveta. We're a global business. Uh, we provide supplier evaluation and also address risk in the supply chain in over 34 sectors in 123 countries. Firstly, I'm going to ask the members of the panel to introduce themselves, and then I'm going to briefly explain what the objectives are for this, this webinar today. So firstly, I'd like to ask Amel, if you could please uh, introduce yourself, Amel. Good morning, everyone. So I'm Amel Messari, Procurement Director. I work for a business called Buig. It is a diversified industrial group listed as one of the top 40 in the French stock market. Our headquarters are in Paris with operations in over 90 countries and a workforce of 118,000 employees. We split into three main sectors of activities, constructions, telecoms and media. I lead the procurement team for Buig Energies and Services Business Unit in the UK, which covers facilities management, refurbishment projects, energy performance contract and street lighting business. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. My name is David Camp. I'm chief executive of the Association of Labour Providers and our members source and supply the workforce into the UK food supply chain. So that's uh, agriculture, food manufacture and food distribution. So these last few weeks have been um, uh, uh, exceptionally busy for our members, um, uh, ensuring that uh, supermarket supply, uh, supermarket shelves remain stocked. Um, as a trade association, we uh, very much promote the fair and proper treatment of the workforce. Uh, we advocate um, responsible recruitment and have developed uh, a website, the Responsible Recruitment Toolkit, to drive uh, good practices globally. And we also lead uh, uh, in uh, a program called Strong Together in uh, uh, preventing um, uh, and responding appropriately to risks of modern slavery and forced labor in supply chains.
I think we're hearing from Mike next. Sorry, uh, I was talking to mute. So it must be a, a, a some, if someone had a pound for every time someone said that whilst we're using Zoom all the time, I think we'd all be rich. Um, so COVID-19, it's focused many clients who use suppliers on the discipline of business continuity. So, so as we've seen with some of the issues in obtaining specific services and goods, it, business continuity is a far wider topic than simply addressing the issues brought about by COVID. It's a much, a much bigger picture. And so today we're going to try and explore the wider implications of business continuity. And we're going to use a, a, a different approach to the traditional webinar. This is not an exercise in selling. It's, as someone who attends webinars and sells a lot, it's really important to me that if someone invests the time to attend a webinar, that they, they hopefully get some value from it. So one of the things that we're hoping to try and achieve today is we've got three very different perspectives on how a business can uh, benefit from the introduction of business continuity. So we have a client perspective, we have a, a perspective of someone who looks after a series of members of smaller businesses who, who work in what we class as an essential industry, and then we also have a expert who delivers and uh, implements business continuity programs. So three very different uh, perspectives on the whole focus. So COVID, it's, it's made us focus on issues very, very specific now to both our domestic and international supply chains, our attitudes to offshoring, and simply being able to deliver our own company's services. Um, Today, we're going to look at how we define business continuity, what steps a business should take when addressing this, and more importantly, maintaining it once, once this crisis is eventually dealt with. So our focus today is going to be on the smaller supplier, the companies that may not have the, the necessary resources that the larger peers may have. So better talking to many, many uh, clients globally, we believe going forward that business continuity is now going to start becoming a subject that clients are going to use to evaluate their suppliers. Not in isolation, but going to be classed as important as some of the other things currently being looked at. So when you tender for work, You'll be used to being asked to produce evidence of your fiscal integrity, your safety and environmental capabilities, your capacity, and so on. So how should this change be addressed in terms of BCP? And exactly what can a smaller company do? So if a client asks you for information, what are you going to provide them? Do you know, do you understand what's being asked of you? So that we will have the facility to be able to uh, ask, uh, um, sorry, deliver questions and answers at the end of the session, which Holly will gather those in, those questions, and then we will deliver them at the end. So, Carla, good evening to you in Australia. Um, if you could Hello. introduce yourself, and um, over to you. Thank you so much. I'd be delighted. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Carla Garn. As Mike has said, I'm sitting in Australia, but I have been working in the UK for the last 23 years as a risk and business continuity manager. And I'm very excited that the IRSM and Aveta have asked me to talk to you tonight or today, this morning, about um, business continuity. So we will do a very, very quick canter through what business continuity is um, and give you some highlights as to how you might be able to um, bring some of these concepts into your business. This is what I look like, just in case. So I, I wasn't ready for the other photos. So just so you have um, some context about me, I have looked after and been involved in business continuity for the best part of 20 years now. And I have helped organisations deal with both in-house and as a consultant, um, things like global terror attacks across Europe. I have been involved in a global cyber attack. I have helped looked after floods and fires and most recently, the Australian bushfires. So I have quite a bit of experience um, in the field, which is what I wanted to share with you. So what is business continuity? And you have the definition from the ISO on your screen, so I'm not going to read it to you. What does that mean in practice? 
So if we look at what our organisation does, it invites us to imagine what the worst thing that could happen will be. And I bet that most of us did not imagine the results of COVID-19, um, even, even if we did have a pandemic plan in place. It invites us to put in place measures um, so that we can mitigate um, the, the impact of those of, of any crisis or any incident so that we can make sure that our organisation is more resilient. And I'd like to explain a little bit about a little bit about the difference between the disciplines of crisis management and disaster recovery and emergency management and business continuity because they're often lumped all in together. And in a way, they all interconnected. But for the purposes of our talk today, we're just going to talk about business continuity. So crisis management looks at the strategic um, aspects. It deals with the very high level immediate response to an incident. Disaster recovery, contrary to the name, talk, is about IT recovery. And emergency management, as the name implies, is the immediate uh, piece that happens after an incident. And it might well be folded into your business continuity plans as well. But today we're just going to focus on business continuity. So I'm just going to, we are playing with technology today. It's quite interesting. So our business continuity plans are, are being tested. So today we're going to talk about three things. Now, the Business Continuity Institute Good Practice Guidelines outline six areas of business continuity practice. Today we're just going to talk about three, but you can go onto their website and download some free materials if you're interested. Today we're going to talk about business impact analysis, which is one of the first steps of the process. We're going to look at design, and one of the parts of design is business continuity plans and putting together teams. And we're going to look at testing, which is exercising or running scenario based um, tests. So what is a business impact analysis? And in my experience, um, people don't do this well. It's just one of those things that falls by the wayside when you're putting in place a business, a business continuity management framework. So business impact analysis is the process of analysing activities and the effect that a business disruption might have on them. So what does that mean in practice? So assuming you've got business management um, buy-in or um, the appetite to do this, you're going to need to look at what are the key activities or processes or procedures that you would want to preserve if something bad happened. And then you need to look at what you are going to need to do to keep the wheels on the bus, as I like to call it. So you're going to be looking at people. So how many people would you need to do to carry out that business activity or that service. Um, bear in mind that the business impact analysis is not a single activity. You might be running it right across your business. It's going to depend on the nature, the size of your organisation, the maturity of your organisation. And the example I like to give is almost every organisation I've ever dealt with always does a business impact analysis around um, their finance team and how to do payroll because everybody wants to get paid, especially in a crisis. So you might want to do a specific BI8 for your payroll process. So, you know, how many people would it take to, to maintain the payroll? Where can they do that from? Can they do it from home? Do they need to be sitting in a particular location? Could you send them to another office or another site um, in different industries? So manufacturing or hospitality, could you do this from another, another place or maybe not? What kind of equipment do you need? So again, for professional services firms, it would be quite easy. It's a, a laptop and, and a printer perhaps, but in other industries, that will, be, that will look very, very different. What equipment might you need to be able to run these processes? What IT um, hardware, software do you need? Lots of firms utilize bespoke um, software packages. How confident are you that you could run that from home or from another location? What are the legal and regulatory impacts that you might be facing if you are unable to do your job properly? Um, seasonality is also an interesting one. So again, going back to that payroll example, is it month end, is it weekend, is it twice, uh, twice a month? I've recently been working for a university and seasonality was very important, therefore take uh, admissions and enrolments and offers. So think about, you know, are there any seasonal um, variations that might impact your processes? 
time limits. I've deliberately not used jargon um, for this presentation. Um, there are lots of acronyms used in the business continuity world. I've just called it time limits. How long could you operate under these circumstances without going under? Your supply chains, and I'm sure lots of people will be talking more about supply chains later, but it's really important to think about the criticality of your suppliers, which suppliers are going to impact on these key or critical processes, and also what impact will you have on a supply chain if you're unable to deliver your goods and services? And then finally, your risks. Um, some people keep a separate risk register at this point for their business continuity risks. Um, others um, just fold it into their principal risk register or team risk registers. But think about um, some of the risks that you might be facing in particular at the moment. So um, when I was writing this, it hadn't really hit the press yet, but the impact of working from home is going to have a lot of impact on information security. And I don't just mean IT. So, you know, you might have client papers or sensitive data. Are you breaching data protection regulations? Are you breaching client terms? Are you more susceptible to being hacked at the moment? All of those things you need to think about and put in place mitigation measures. So we're going to talk about plans next. So once you've done your business impact analysis, you will then start thinking about what you need to do. And one of those things is create a business continuity plan or plans, and you might have multiple plans. There's no such thing as the right way to do this or the wrong way to do this. But these are some of the things you will need to um, incorporate in your plans. You might have a, as we talked about earlier, you might have a crisis response plan that sits separately. You might have the IT disaster recovery plan sitting separately, and you might have emergency management plan sitting separately. But in your business continuity plan, these are the key things that you will be looking at. So who are your key staff? Do you have all of their contact details? How will you invoke the plan? How will you bring the team together? Where are you going to work? Um, and putting the COVID situation to one side for a moment, some organisations might have disaster recovery centres that they have hired or um, have agreements with where they can go and work, or you might have alternative office locations, or you might work from home, as everybody seems to be doing at the moment. Um, details of your welfare services, so counselling. If something bad happens, you want to be able to get people counselling and other, you know, you might want doctor's details on tap. Your security services, your technology, your communications and data information. Transportation and logistics. So um, I know of organisations who have taxi firms listed on their business continuity plans or a bus firm if they need to move people quickly. All of those kinds of things. Alternate suppliers of priority services. Because it's business continuity, you want to be robust. You want more than one supplier. Um, the contact information um, to act, you know, you need contact details. I'm a big fan of checklists on business continuity plans as well, because in um, when people are under stress um, in this type of situation, your brain doesn't always function as it should. So having a checklist is also helpful in these circumstances. A quick note on teams. So teams are really important. And if there was one thing I had to say to you about business continuity and business continuity plans, and it's great to have the plan and have it sitting on the shelf or on a SharePoint site or wherever you store your documents, it's all about the people. And it's really important that you have the right people on your team um, for a plan to be effective, it's got to come to life and those people all have to know their roles and responsibilities and how to behave and respond during an incident. It's no good to have people's names on the plan just because they are the right job title. Um, it helps if those people are empowered to make decisions, but it's really important that those people are the right people for the team. I have worked with teams and exercise teams We'll talk about exercising in a moment. But when I've run exercises, people have broken down in tears because um, the experience of running an exercise or being put under pressure or stress in this situation has triggered anxiety or some kind of flashback for them and they have not been able to function as part of that team. Um, you need to be sure that you have, uh, you know, you need to be sensitive to that sort of um, situation and make sure that the people on the team understand um, what they need to do 
they need to know that if they're not needed during a particular incident and they're asked to stand down that it's not personal it's just part of the most efficient response and again that's a really important thing to know um, desktop exercises are really important um, they are my favorite part of being a business continuity practitioner um, because you get to experience things in a safe way so the benefits of exercising include validation so you're testing the technical uh, the technical the logistics um, the administrative aspects of your business continuity plan is what you've written in the plan practical because often it isn't um, is it achievable um, how do you know where the team will meet um, what happens if that room isn't available or that particular space isn't available at that point in time out of hours does your conference calling facility work does everybody have everybody's phone numbers if there's a cyber attack and i'm speaking from experience here um, and there are no there's no access to people's phone numbers do you have them written down somewhere it's those practical things that you can test during an exercise um, think about um, how it minimizes disruption during an incident the more routine practices um, the better and faster they will work during an incident um, I worked with a team in Manchester who were great. Um, they voluntarily pulled themselves together once a month um, to talk about potential things that could happen um, as you know to their office and to their team. And when the bombing happened at the Manchester Arena, they managed their response for four regional offices. They had counseling in place within hours. We had people in hospital critically injured. They responded. They were just amazing, but it was because they were a well-oiled machine and they worked together, they built relationships. Um, learning. So that, that was the piece on resource management. Again, making sure you've got the right people and they work together well as a team. The learning piece, it lets you learn in a safe environment. It's really critical that people are able to exercise their voice and to practice in a safe environment whether it's right whether it's wrong it doesn't matter the more emotionally charged that um, learning experience is the better it will be remembered and better if you're trying to We've lost you there, Carla. And um, Mike, would you like to pick up? Um, sorry, I'm not too sure what's happened there. Um, we'll try and reconnect with Carla because that was right uh, in, in the middle of the um, the actual process. So um, hopefully, Carla can still hear us. It's one of the uh, one of the issues of, of dealing with things on a live basis. So. Thank you so much for what we've done at the moment, uh, Carla, and we will be making this um, these slides available as well. But this is not a uh, one of those death by PowerPoint. Uh, we've got a slightly different approach here. And what we're going to do now is we're going to reach out to uh, the different individuals on the panel and ask them questions in, in, a, uh, in a type of interview format to try and get their perspective and hopefully we can learn from from these different perspectives and apply those in our everyday business. So, um, move, moving forward, my first question for Amel, who will be giving the uh, the client perspective. Um, so, Amel, um, COVID it's it, it's impacts on virtually every business within the UK. So, using the discussion points that we we, we achieved thus far with Carla, um, and our focus on the smaller supplier. Do you think companies within your supply chain, the smaller companies, had really considered BCP in any capacity before COVID? Thank you, Mike. Um, thank you, Carla, for the presentation. A very interesting point. Um, indeed, all our business, all businesses, not only, I would say, within the UK, but also internationally, 
Most of the services that we prov provide to our clients are services that need to be done on site, whether that be cleaning in a hospital in Oxford, for example, or building a solar farm in Wales. Unfortunately, a lot of our supply chain do not have a luxury of allowing people to work from home as a service must be provided or, for example, a hospital being built. So the last few months have been interesting ones as a large proportion of our supply chain are SMEs. And yes, most of them did not have PCPs in place. Even if some were in place, they didn't satisfy the requirements of a once in a century pandemic like this, as Carla has mentioned earlier on on her talk. To, mit to mitigate the lack of BCPs in place, we sent a questionnaire to our supply chain to assess how they have been aff affected by this pandemic, what impact this situation might have on them in providing the service, and how BUIG could support them. Overall, the feedback was positive. They were pleased that we were communicating with them. We also had already identified our critical supply chain. So as uh, Carla uh, mentioned, it is important that you've got uh, a list of all of your uh, suppliers and the right contacts and et cetera within our own uh, BCP. So I asked my procurement team to ensure that they called them all and have conversation uh, with them in, and, and having direct feedback rather than sometimes also just having emails being sent and not read. Thank you. Thank you, Amel. So uh, I'd like to um, address a question to yourself, David. Um, so as, as the person in charge of a influential trade association, which actually came about through a, uh, a very tragic occurrence uh, many years ago, um, um, you have your members, as you've already alluded to, working in essential industries. What challenges do you see for these organisations in, in your membership if they're asked to actually look at implementing BCP, as many are operating on tight margins as they are now? Do, do you see this as a, as a challenge for them? Um, yeah, thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, smaller businesses uh, have... Uh, a number of priorities which they which they focus on you know s survival being one how they actually deliver their services the operations how they win new business of course how they grow the business and and how they make a profit those are the those are kind of the the things that small businesses tend to focus on but but good companies the good the, the better small businesses will adopt um, principles of BCP. And they might not call it that, but they're looking at risks, what could happen, uh, and putting in place um, uh, preventative measures to, uh, to enable those risks to be reduced and to be responded to appropriately if they do occur. So um, most small businesses hopefully will uh, will ensure against those risks so that if those things do happen that they um, uh, uh, can, can meet the financial challenges. They will look at what they do and um, and, and ensure that there are more than one staff member uh, who can do the different aspects within the business. They'll perhaps look at their client base and seek to diversify that so that they're not over reliant on um, one or two particular clients. They will hopefully um, uh, 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 ensure that their IT systems are protected, they have appropriate um uh firewalls and um uh, and protect and cyber security protections in place and this is what differentiates um good businesses from those not so good businesses what i what i don't think uh, uh is that many will have formalized this with risk registers, with business continuity plans. And I think this 
um, this this kind of black swan, this this pandemic may well focus businesses in the future to being more um, structured and disciplined about doing that. Yeah, which I'm firstly going to address to yourself, Amel, and then and then David. So, from the perspective of working with smaller companies going forward, so looking at the principles of BCP, as as Carla has, has uh, demonstrated, there's lots of moving parts with that, and I think for the safety people who have, have, have tuned into this webinar, there's lots of synergies there with implementing an SMS or an EMS, etc. So. As part of the um, overall business strategy of using suppliers, what kind of support do you think clients will need to provide to make this move effective? So that question to you first, Amel, and then to yourself, David, from your members' perspective. We're talking about support from clients as well as supplier. So as discussed earlier on, business continuities plan should form an essential part of an organization tool for ensuring that they can maintain continuity of critical supply and services. Our SMEs will need more support in developing effective BCPs. So we partner actually with Aveta for our supply chain onboarding and performance reviews. And it was actually great to see that Aveta reacted quickly and developed a section devoted to COVID-19 under the resource page of their website, where they shared templates of business continuity plans, coronavirus checklists, and a guide on how to fill it in. And as Carla mentioned, it is important to have this in place. So I have promoted those details to our supply chain, as it is important to have a template document for this. And as uh, we discussed earlier on, the smaller businesses uh, might not be able to have the, the possibility of doing that. And as David mentioned it, it is important that BCPs get formalized. So the other thing that I am in the process of developing is an online workshop like those that we've done in the past, where we've invited a number of our small supply chain and a consultant from Sustainability Supply Chain School who delivers training on different elements of sustainability. So I thought that it would be useful to have a workshop such as this webinar and making it interactive on supporting our supply chain on understanding the purpose and structure of BCPs, being able to create one, ensuring that it covers the service recovery and the disaster management back to business as usual. And finally, to ensure that they have identified the critical resources required. One final point that I also want to mention uh, that is quite key in the support of our small SMEs and BUIG as being a responsible employer the way one of the best way that we can also support our supply chain is ensuring that we pay them on time for those who have provided the service and those that are still providing the service we must ensure we do not impact on their cash flow we just want to make sure that we all come out of this uh, all well thank you And picking up from uh, from Amel's point there, um, you know, I, I I look at it from a trade trade association perspective, and and I'll be honest and say that um, uh, we have not provided any guidance or information to our members on business continuity planning. Um, we provide many technical briefs much guidance on many aspects um, uh, uh, of, uh, of of running their businesses to support them, but um, uh, we haven't done anything on business continuity planning. So I think for our for us, our first um, first job to do is to provide a technical brief with checklists uh, that these uh, that are that our members can follow and i'll um i'll be in conversation with a veta about maybe whether we can work together on that um and so i think that's our that's our first step to deliver that to members and then 
to enable them to seek specialist and expert support uh, if they need it and depending on the size of their business. Okay. Do, do you think um, the, the, the clients your members work for, do you think they should be giving or helping these smaller companies um, to some of the initiatives that Amel referenced? Yeah, I uh, and thanks, Mike, I was going to make that point. Um, certainly, I think um, ensuring, uh, put, putting this into, um, into tenders, um, encouraging uh, encouraging suppliers to um, to have developed these plans um, uh, I suppose nudging them towards doing it where they haven't done it already ensuring that uh, there is a, a, a higher level review of those plans is helpful um, I was gonna uh, I was gonna pick up in a, in a later question on this sort of supply chain responsibility, I think there is that there is a big responsibility, and, I, and, I, and I'm not sure we've got it quite right in this country at the moment for larger organisations towards the top of their supply chain to be ensuring that they are paying enough and paying quickly enough for businesses to have these added protections within their within their um, uh, uh, setups very often it is so completely price driven that organizations are stripped bare and can't actually sometimes afford to have these added protections in place so ensuring that these are these are these, these protections are taken consideration of in um, uh, 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 in in, in approval and appointment processes of suppliers. I think is um, uh, is essential to and and and, and, a, and an issue like this pandemic um, only raises the importance of that. Great, thank you. So I'm hoping we've managed to reconnect to Carla. Um, so if, if you if you're managed to reconnect, Carla, could you could you respond, please? Audio now. So. Oh, perfect, perfect. Thank you. So um, uh, shortly. Okay. So uh, my my question for for you, Carla, um, as someone who has implemented many many management programs addressing. Uh, business continuity and risk so so we're actually ready for what may occur next and that could be floods in the north of England the loss of a strategic supplier for example what would be the most effective first step for a smaller company uh, to take when they're actually putting this type of program in place because what we don't want to see is masses of consultants suddenly starting to sell their wares in this particular area because the company knows their risk similar to to health and safety uh risk what where where do you see the first steps being so they can actually start to see the true value of this type of program hello Are you, can you so if we can move on to the next question and we'll try and reconnect oh. Carla again before we end Oh, okay, okay. Uh, apologies. Um, it's one of these things that happens on um, on live events. So, um, a, a question for yourself, Amel. Um, looking at the client's perspective, uh, as someone who places orders with with SMEs, um, has has the issue of COVID, and it maybe sounds an obvious question, but has the, the the impacts created by COVID on your business? Has it refocused your thoughts within Bouig um, as to how you're going to start evaluating suppliers going forward? You know, pre-tender, pre how are you, is, is BCP going to focus into your criteria? You look at safety, you look at their financials, et cetera. Is this something that Bouig will start to, uh, to address? 
Well, in, in fact, it's interesting that like, we already had as part of our onboarding um, uh, within the platform with Aveta, where we already ask our supply chain if they have a BCP in place. However, truthfully, have we spent, spent much time in reviewing this as part of the evaluation? Probably not. However, I would say now, we will need to ensure that we do review it and depending on the criticality of a supply chain. So as uh, uh, Carla mentioned it uh, earlier on, ensuring that you do not have just one supplier, for example, providing the services across the board. And um, so there is quite a bit of work that we need to do on this to support our onboarding process, but we need to also ensure that we review it on an ongoing basis, not just as a one-off. Excellent. Thank, thank you, Amel. Um, a question to yourself, David, um, and I appreciate this is quite a wide reaching question and some of the implications are not so much related to BCP, but could impact on the overall brand of the business going forward. So with some of the changes being brought about by different working practices, uh, we know more and more people are working from home at the moment. Um, Companies are looking at different options to keep themselves trading. Um, is there a risk post-COVID that this might create uh, poorer labour standards or issues around safety or even increase the potential for modern slavery right across the board? Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely, Mike. And um, I thought... Organized crime gangs and 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 those who make their uh, money from exploiting others are clever and quick to react. So we'll have seen in the news this morning um, the the cocaine bust, cocaine being um, smuggled in amongst face masks. We are already dealing here in website recruitment scams um, whereby uh, websites have been set up very quickly and they're trying to scam money out of individuals for fake jobs in, uh, in, in agriculture. Um, we have seen well-meaning um individuals and, and good-hearted individuals trying to move individuals from uh you know from you know newly unemployed newly furloughed workers into work in the essential sector but they are not aware of the um methods used by uh modern day slave masters and um organized crime gangs to uh, <laughs> circumvent um, uh, established recruitment patterns and, and, and get into work. So we're already seeing those um, on a, uh, and, and that, that those, those issues extend not just in the food and agricultural sector, but into construction, uh, into any sector where, um, individuals, um, maybe market workers, maybe um, temporary workers are, are, are open to exploitation. Um, there is, of course, on a, uh, um, uh, on a um, something that's affecting everyone, the issues around homeworking um, and the, the risks that, that can be in there with regard to cybersecurity general health and safety. I think we are seeing lots of organizations reviewing their home working policies. Um, uh, and and I think we will see improvement through those. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I ask all organizations to be alert to the risks and to, um, and to look at the potential risks 
uh, that there are in their new businesses around uh, the new practices that they are having to adopt in response to this uh, uh, this crisis. Right. Thank you um, for that, David. Um, I have. Uh, I don't know. Have you managed to rejoin Carla at all? No, unfortunately not. Okay. Uh, Mike, we'll just uh, check Carla's name now. Bear with us for a moment. Okay. All right, Carla, I've just made you a presenter, so you should be able to activate your mic now. I don't know if you can hear me now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Carla. Thank you. How exciting. I'm so sorry. The joys of technology. Um, Mike, shall I go back to your previous question about what people could be doing now? That would be fantastic because that's where I see a, a lot of value uh, for people listening who've never done this before. What is, you know, you know, the hardest part of the, the long journey is the first step. So that's, Absolutely. That, that's what I'd like you to try and explain so hopefully people can understand what they need to sure. do look at this. So some, I'm not sure where the, where the presentation cut out, but some of those points on doing a business impact analysis or doing your plans are great. But what I would recommend doing at the moment, whether you have an established business continuity framework or if you haven't, is bringing a group of people together and thinking about what your organization looks like now and what it might look like in the future, trying to do some horizon scanning. What do you want to do? How do you want to come out of this? And um, while David's been talking about risks and I wholeheartedly agree with everything he, he's been saying, I also think this is a really exciting opportunity for, for organizations to innovate as well and to focus on what they're really good at. It might mean that you have to change your business models but bring a group of people together and find out what you think the new normal is and use some of those principles of the business impact analysis to say, okay, well, what if something else hit us right now, how could we survive? What would we need to do to survive? So, and we've touched on the IT thing at the moment, but sitting here in Australia, I'm also very cognizant of natural disasters. I'd, I'd forgotten how many there are here on a regular basis. What would happen if you were hit by flood or fire or, you know, something very um, common, if you like, the, the traditional business continuity incident? What would happen if all of your um, workforce was taken out with the virus at the moment? How would you survive? Run some of those scenarios and think about what you would need to do to keep going. How many people do you need? Um, who Who is really important? Who might you need to to keep separate from others so that they don't get sick or they don't, um, you know, as we were talking earlier, I, I could still hear you all, um, you know, making sure that more than one person knows how to do a critical, a critical role. All of those kinds of things need to be considered, but bring a group of people together so that you're not biased and somebody isn't doing it in isolation. And I know that's really hard to do at the moment and everybody's focus is on just surviving. But I also think this could be a really exciting opportunity for lots of organisations to to really pick up and to to focus on what they're good at. Is that helpful? Can you still hear me? You there? I'm just I'm just very conscious of the time and I know I appreciate it. I'm not sure if you can still hear me. So I'll keep talking just in case. Um, one of the things I am seeing at the moment is, is lots of work around supply chain questionnaires and people asking um, about the viability of organisations in a supply chain. So I'm expecting there will be lots of questionnaires and lots of responses required. So thinking about how you can provide assurances up and down your supply chain is going to be really critical as well. Okay, that's great, Carla. Can, can you hear me okay, Carla? I can, I can. Yeah, perfect. So um, I'm just very conscious of the time and obviously we've been fraught with a few technical difficulties as they say, um, and we do have some questions um, from from the uh, audience. So if I could hand back 
to Holly, who is the uh, the custodian of the questions. Could you please run through those, um, please, Holly? Yeah, so just a reminder to everyone, if you do have any questions, um, please just pop those in the chat function that's on the bottom right corner of your screen. Um, and we'll take five um, five or ten minutes now to, to answer, uh, answer those for you. So we've got one question at the moment. And that is, um, are there any examples of companies which have responded to COVID-19 effectively? Who would you like to answer that question, Mike? Carla, sorry, I'll... but that's a question to Carla. Can, can, can we pass that question to, um, well, we've already, I think, um, with, with a, I mean, a Mel's response before. Um, can, you, can, you hear the, can you hear the questions, Carla? I can. I'm, I'm still on. Um, I, I am in a different country, so, so my experience might be very different to yours. I think the Australian experience of, of COVID-19 has been um, very different to the UK experience from my conversations with people. And again, also very different with um, companies and organisations in the US and in Europe. Um, so from, a, from an Australian perspective, I, I think everybody is just battling and struggling to survive. I think those with strong leadership have, have done well, but Australia has many, many small businesses and they are struggling to survive at the moment. So I can't think of a specific example to give you, um, but I will, I will keep my thinking cap on. Please. Well, Holly, Hi Mike, yes, so the next question is how can the supply chain be continuously managed during this lockdown effectively? Say that question again please. How can the supply chain be continuously managed during this lockdown effectively? That's really, I'm not... I would, I'd like to see that from a client's perspective. Is that something you could answer, Amel? I'm just going to hand broad, over to Amel now. Yeah, it's quite a broad, broad question. Hi, Mike. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. So, yeah, in relation to how supply chain can be continuously managed during this lockdown effectively, I would say you need to really be able to keep in touch, ensuring that you actually form uh, the critical supply chain, uh, just to be able to have a conversation with them and seeing how they are, uh, are there things that you can support them with and etc. That's something that we have put in place uh, within our procurement team and the result has been, as I mentioned earlier on, uh, very very, uh, very good because um, um, I think it would have been uh, uh, scarier or, or if there was, wasn't any communication. One of the points that I, I sort of wanted to mention is it's important that at this time we're still building relationships with our supply chain and not just switch them off. Even if you are not using them, you should carry on um, ensuring to uh, 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 keep in regular contact with them. We, we also, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, sort of put questionnaire out. So we've put a tool uh, uh, with different questions that we need to have answers in. Because they, know that they, they know that we are there to support them should there be a need. I have a question, um, Holly, if I may. Uh, this is from my own personal uh, perspective. Um, Having been in health and safety for many years, we have sort of defined processes, and this is to Carla, so hopefully you can still hear me. We have defined processes how we address uh, safety risk or environmental impacts. Is the principle of addressing the business risk the same, where you identify the risk and 
you look at in, uh, uh, the different controls that you can implement to, to reduce that that risk. Is it a, is it a similar process? Card representer, so hopefully we'll be able to take her down to now. Did you manage to hear the question, Carla? Okay, I will I will go to another question and hopefully what I think we can do, Holly, because this has been fraught with um, technical issues, um, the, the questions that we have, we will issue to the to the speakers as well and ask them to to add some verbiage post event because if people have gone to the trouble of asking questions, I think it's important that we answer them. Um, so I have one more question before we um, before we close, and this is a question to uh, Amel. So look looking at how COVID has impacted on supply chains and the impacts on obtaining materials, etc. Do you think clients going forward are now going to start, before they issue in contracts, do you think they're going to start insisting that a company has um, a business continuity mechanism in place that can be subject to scrutiny? It's not to say that a third party will um, evaluate it for its effectiveness, because that's down to you as the individual using it. But do you think a client will start saying, we want to see evidence that you have things like this in place before we give you a contract. And that's a question to Amel before before we close. I, 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 guess, I guess that type of question gets uh, asked uh, uh, very often uh, by our uh, own clients where they do ask us to actually demonstrate to them that we have a business continuity plan in place. And I think if I think of myself as in my supply chain, I think that certain critical uh, uh, supply chain we will be, yes, definitely ensuring that we review uh, uh, properly any business continuity plan that they might have put in place to ensure that it can uh, 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 it can protect us or, or support us in, in moments of uh, crisis such as this. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm just conscious of the time. Um, I want to, uh, before I just pass back to uh, to Holly, um, I want to thank all the presenters. Um, and I do apologize for some of these uh, technical issues we've had. I can promise you they weren't planned. Um, and it's been a little bit testing. So we try to, to make the best of this. And hopefully you've appreciated the different approach to this webinar that we've tried to take. Um, and hopefully giving you some uh, additional insight and value, because for me, it's really important as someone who, who attends these themselves, uh, as, whether it's to gather CPD or just to gain, gain knowledge or, or, or whatever it might be. So uh, thank you for bearing with us. It is greatly appreciated. And one thing that I will uh, finish with, um, Amel uh, advised that Aveta has produced free business templates to help the smaller company uh, in, in getting started on their business continuity journey. These are freely available on the Aveta site, aveta.com. If, if someone wishes to uh, obtain those, there's, there's no obligation, they're there to help you. We're trying to do something positive and give something back. So if, if somebody wishes to use those, again, I uh, emphasize these are to get you on the journey. They are not uh, something uh, uh, that will be designed for a very sophisticated business. These are for the smaller company um, to, to get you moving and get you thinking about the different types of risks that could impact on your business going forward. Okay, so I'd like to hand over to you now, Holly, to, uh, to, to close down. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. And yes, just um, in summary, I'll be following up later on today um, or tomorrow with a recording to the webinar. So if you'd like to recap in your own time or share with any of your um, colleagues, then please feel free to do so. 
on the screen at the moment as well, you can also see the link um, to the Aveta website where the business continuity plan templates um, are available to download. And again, I'll be sharing that in the email, the follow-up email I sent. So yeah, do, I do apologize um, again for some of the sound issues that we've had, but I hope you've still managed to um, get, what you, get what you wanted out of the um, webinar. And finally, just a thank you to our speakers for sharing their insights and experiences and also to Aveta for organizing this. Thank you. Goodbye.